Hey, welcome to our conversation today with Sean and me. Uh, we don't have a particular guest in mind, though we are going to talk about a, a controversial and provocative new book that's getting a lot of traction uh, in, in circles, not in evangelical Christian circles, but in broader cultural circles as well. Uh, the book is titled very provocatively, Jesus and John Wayne. Uh, and the subtitle, I think, is particularly revealing, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. The author is Kristen Cubs Dume. She's a historian at Calvin University. She's widely published, has written a number of other things having to do with women and the gospel, uh, and has published in a variety of, pu of uh, national publications as well. She's a very respected historian, but has come out with a very controversial topic that we want to explore. We want to see, we want to look both at the, at the merits and the demerits of the book and take an honest and uh, fair, we hope fair, assessment of it to, to recognize its contributions, what she got right, and where we would take issue with her. So, Sean, we're really delighted to be able to talk about this just yeah. to, together with the two of us. Uh, so maybe the, the first thing that uh, we want to talk about was how, how should we approach such a controversial book like this? Because there, there are a couple different ways to look at this. And I want to make sure that we're, we're reading this through the right set of lenses. Yeah, this is a great question. I can just tell you how I approach a book like this. The title is Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. In other words, the reason the faith is corrupted religiously and the nation is fractured is because of white evangelicals. I'm looking at this going... I'm a white evangelical, That's right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, Kristen Dume, who's the author, uh, actually, I heard in a different interview, said that she grew up in a tradition in the church that she's not evangelical and almost had a sense of disdain against evangelicals. That word might be too strong. I don't want to so put that on dis her. disaffected evangelical would be a fair term for it? Um, I don't know if it's disaffected. I think it was just a tradition that saw evangelicals differently and a very kind of an intellectual tradition is what where she came from. So, but she says she grew up in kind of the evangelical subculture with the speakers and books and products and is well aware of it. Well, I am a white evangelical. So when I pick up a book like this, it's just human nature to get defensive. So what I try to do as well as I can is to resist some of that and say, okay, can I humble myself? Is there areas where my people have gone wrong? What do we need to learn? And I've certainly found that people outside of our group, whether it's religiously or faith, will notice things that we may not. So for those watching this who might be evangelicals or white, let's not get defensive. Let's read a book like this and ask ourselves, what can we learn from this and get better? I think that's the first step. I think it's probably helpful to know that she's not talking specifically about Scott Ray and Sean McDowell, <laughs> you know, or, or any of our listeners no, personally I, or individually. No, but she, she does mention my dad. But she is talking, I mean, but she's talking about our tribe. Yes, our with, tribe. With and him. my father is mentioned there. So there's a level of it being personal. Even that I have to read and go, okay, is she making a fair critique? I think we just, we have to approach it that way to be scholars, to grow. Human nature is just to get defensive. But you're right, it's not about you and me in particular, viewers may actually be evangelicals but disagree with much of you know, how other evangelicals right. say things. And, as, and I think as long as our doctrine of sin is what it is, nobody's exempt from admitting their faults, admitting places where they are broken, and recognizing that we, have, we, we all have things mm -hmm. to learn. We never get exempt from having things to learn. Yeah. So, uh, but that, I think, but I think we, also, we also need to be fair and to point out the places where we think she's missed the mark, mm -hmm. which there's there's more than a handful of those places too. There are. I, th I think there's positive in this book that I think evangelicals and other Christians need to take seriously. She has diagnosed some serious issues we need to put attention to. But as we'll get to, I think there's some areas of, of concern. The other way approaching that, oh, go ahead. No, go know? ahead. Yeah. The other way of, of, of approaching this is when I look at a subtitle, and I know authors don't come up with subtitles and even titles sometimes, it says how white evangelicals corrupted a faith and fractured a nation. We live in a moment where everything is seen through the lens of race. Now, sometimes it's positive because we haven't seen racial elements that are there. 
and we need to see them. Other times, race is brought in and made the primary issue when people like Thomas Sowell and others would say, I'm not sure that's all that's going on. So when I see a subtitle like this, I immediately think this tells us about the wider culture that we live in. There's an audience automatically built in when you blame whites who are in power, evangelicals and part of the Christian tradition who are seem seemingly in power. It tells us something about the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. Well, and it also may tell us a little bit about the ideology from which the author is coming. It could. And, and we'll, see, we'll see as we get into that uh, how, how prevalent that turns out to be. So let's, let's for, for the sake of our audience here, who, are, who likely is not familiar with the book yet, uh, we, and, we, and we would encourage you to read it. We'd encourage you to read it and to mm -hmm. learn from it, uh, but to, to read it through a set of critical lenses as well, not taking everything in there as gospel truth. In fact, I hope you don't, I hope you don't read anything exactly. that you read as gospel truth other than the Old and New Testament. Yeah. Uh, so tell, let's just briefly summarize for our audience what the book's mm -hmm. about and what you think the author's trying to accomplish. Yeah, so Kristen Dumay is a professor of history at Calvin University. So the book is taking a historical look at these issues. That's yeah, and her it goes, expertise. And it starts early oh, on. It starts back in the 1920s. It do, I mean, it's over 300 pages, and she's a great historian. She's a great writer. I've heard her interview such just a pleasant, thoughtful person. It's clear that she's writing this because she wants to call the church back to faithfulness as the way that she sees it. Uh, but she's writing from a historical angle, not primarily theological, not primarily sociological. It's a historical analysis right. of the past hundred years or so that culminates in the election of the presidency of Donald Trump. So the, the premise, she starts out really quickly and describes, she asks a question that I, just, I think it's a great question. She says, how could family values conservatives support a man, namely Trump, who flouted every value they insisted they held dear? So historically speaking, how do many evangelicals come to support this man, Trump, who in her mind, and she fills in some of the details here about him being anti-immigration, nationalist, racist, sexist. That's the lens through which she understands him. I'm not saying whether he is or whether he's not, but this is how Trump is painted in the book. And the question is, how do we support you know, how do evangelicals support him? So she says this, and I think this is really interesting. She says, quote, on page three at the bottom, she says, it was rather, this was not an aberration that evangelicals support Trump, nor was it merely a pragmatic choice. It was rather the culmination of evangelicals' embrace of militant masculinity and ideology that enshrines patriarchal authority and condones the callous display of power at home and abroad. So in other words, evangelicals have adopted a certain view of masculinity, a certain view of a fear-based approach to culture, where we want these heroes to come in and save us, yeah, whether like, it's like John, John, Wayne. Like John Wayne. John Wayne is a classic example. Yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and it's even extended to our foreign policy. Foreign policy on every angle. And a couple, yeah. one other thing she says that I think will help as we come back to this is she makes a quick distinction. She says, for example, in Sunday schools and vacation Bible schools, boys learn to be superheroes for Christ, girls to be beautiful princesses. In church youth groups, boys train to use guns and bows, girls to apply makeup, shop, and to decorate cakes. And so... She says, the next page, for many evangelicals, the masculine values men like John Wayne, William Wallace from Braveheart, played by Mel Gibson, Ronald Reagan, Rush Limbaugh, Jordan Peterson, and Donald Trump embody have come to define evangelicalism itself. That's the premise of the okay. book, and she explores it historically. Yeah, now I will say, I'm glad she went back as far as she did, because mm. there's a there's a, a brief reference to the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. There is, yes. <laughs> in, uh, in, in the early 1920s as resisting mm -hmm. this politi politicization of Christian faith mm -hmm. uh, that she, she found so, so prevalent. Uh, 
th throughout the last hundred years. And I found that kind of very interesting that uh, it's the, that the, the, the fundamentals, quote, that, that five-volume series came out of mm -hmm. the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, you know, underscoring the importance of the, the, you know, the, the mainstays of the main anchors of Christian faith, while at the same time she recognized, and I think correctly so, that it was designed mm. – the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, which now is, of course, Biola University, right, right. was designed to be uh, you know, this apolitical uh, you know, organization, institution that welcomed people from all races, ethnicities, and mm -hmm. political persuasions uh, to, because, the, because it was the gospel and the scriptures – that were the central focus. I think what's really interesting as I was I was trying. Oh, here it is. That was that was a same a shame, shameless plug for Biola well, University. Well, but, but what's fascinating? But I think is rightly so. She's she critiques Christian nationalism a lot, which you and I actually would agree. Maybe she has a different understanding of Christian nationalism. Is an unhealthy or unbiblically wedding of the nation of Israel. And America is like the second coming of the nation of Israel, right, so that the, to speak. That the United States is central to God's program yes, in, in, in that's the way a, that that's Israel a, was. A better way of putting it. And she cites Biola, interestingly enough, who says, and she gives a quote in here that, let me see if I can read it here, where uh, one of the, the King's Business's publication of Biola says, no, America is not a Christian nation because, quote, such a nation does not exist on earth and never has existed and never will exist until the Lord comes again. So it actually was pushing back in the earlier part mm -hmm. of the 20th century. Uh, so she's saying Biola was on the right side, but clearly things have shifted since that time over the last 80, 100 years, so to speak. Yeah, which and that view, of course, clearly comes out of our eschatology, mm -hmm. which we hold that the, the nation of Israel still has a place as God's mm -hmm. chosen nation, even, even in the, the present age. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the, no no other nation enjoys that those same privileges and prerogatives. And mm -hmm. I think we, as we've pointed out before, to wed the gospel to any kind of national agenda for any country, other than the the prophesied nation of Israel, mm -hmm. I think is going theologically off the rails. I think that's right, and this may be getting ahead to some of our critique. We want to talk about yeah, positives exactly. first, but the point being there are a lot of strains in evangelicalism resisting a certain narrative that she's telling, yeah. and we're going to get to and some I would, of those. I'm, I'm actually I'm, – I'm very proud yeah. of our founders yeah, me too. For, for the stance they took and mm -hmm. the openness with which – they welcomed people from all, you know from all backgrounds and all races and ethnicities, while at the same time maintaining the centrality of the gospel and mm. bi biblical faithfulness. So let's let I, th I, th I think hopefully our audience is somewhat clear on what uh, our author is up to and what she's trying to accomplish. It is, it is a long historical stretch. So if you, if you yep. don't like reading history, we suggest <laughs> that you cut to the conclusion. Right, right. And, get, and just get to the point, the, the main things that she's trying to get across. But if you enjoy the historical sketch and the background, granted it's through a, through a, a unique set of lenses, uh, you'll enjoy that part. I did, and it was, it yeah. was, it, they were helpful reminders of a lot of the tradition that that formed the, the evangelical faith that you and I were brought up in. I, yeah, I, I would, I think this is a good place to start because there are some positives that come out of her book. And I had three as I read it that I think, even if somebody takes issue with her premise, needs to take these very seriously. And one is in the area of gender stereotypes. Okay. So Which, she, which means well, we read earlier that you go in vacation yeah. Bible school. Boys are taught to be yeah. warriors. Girls are taught to be princesses. Maybe, uh, my, maybe my church was not as evangelical as I thought it was. Well, ma my, ma maybe not. Yeah. But this this yeah. this is definitely a common theme. She gives enough examples. I don't think it's as widespread as the only story in evangelicalism as she says that it is, but I think it's definitely there, present that is there yeah, there are definitely the nuance. There are definitely no cer question certain about segments it. Yeah. for which that has been the case. And the point is not that being a warrior, we want to say that's not 
manly. What we want to say is that's not the only way to express manhood because as you and I have talked about as it comes to issues of sexuality and even the transgender issue that the church has bought certain stereotypes about masculinity and what happens is when somebody is like hey I don't really want to go carry a sword I want to cook I want to sing the worship band and this is a male I want to do art starts to feel like well maybe I'm not a male I don't measure up to this stereotype And it does do harm to people with gender dysphoria if that's the only story we tell without nuance. Or even even people, as you mentioned, people without specifically gender dysphoria, but just people who don't, you know, for whatever reason, don't fit that stereotype Mm. of what a, quote, manly man should be. Uh, You know, and there there are lots of, I mean, we have lots of kids who they just, they do other things besides play sports. You know, they do other things besides, you know, go hunting and fishing. Uh, You know, they just do other things. And and I think we we have to look back at, you know, what's what's the Scripture's picture of manliness and who are some of the heroes of the faith Mm -hmm. and what were they like? I mean, you know, David David was a warrior. That's true. But he was also a musician and a poet and a poet. poet. (laughs) Uh, and a deeply emotional person. I mean, for the for the the idea that the myth that the manly man would not wear his emotions on his sleeves, David certainly disqualified from that. Just read the lament he, psalms. He does. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's. So you know, by he's the way, in, all, in audiences, I'll say I've done this dozens of times. Give me an example of a manly man. Two first examples every time. David, Samson. I think one time somebody shouted out Jesus. <laughs> Nobody has ever said Jacob. Yeah. I mean, you take Jacob and Esau. I'll ask people who's more manly, yeah. and they're like, Esau hunted, and he was hairy. Jacob was a homebody favored by his mom. Well, Jacob was the chosen exactly. one, and there's no indication that one is more masculine than feminine. Now, we can make a mistake by saying there's no differences between males That's and females right. and arguably no distinct roles. But the flip side is also to come up with these stereotypes. And I think she fairly critiques in the church that we have bought on these stereotypes, namely John Wayne. I think she nails that and the church needs to make some changes. The other thing she brings up, and I especially want to know your thoughts on this, is she gives a lot of examples of well-known influential evangelicals who were way too cozy with political rulers. Gives examples, when I read some of these, I'm like, wow, this is arguably compromising principle for the sake of power and influence. And that's a dangerous, dangerous thing, especially when Jesus was so much about, if you want to follow me, you know, the first shall be last, give up your life. So I think she's on to that. Do you think that's a significant issue as she mentions? What would you add to that piece? Well, um, the, the first thing I think our audience is going to think about in that is the friendship that Billy Graham had with with virtually every president in his lifetime, mm-hmm. um, and they were good. They were he had good relationships with them, and you don't get the sense that he was courting any sort of political power. He was using that as an opportunity to advance the gospel. Now she takes a little different take on that. Yes, and that Graham is not quite as as innocent about the power moves as I think some of us some of us would like to think. Sure. But it was it was I mean he was an equal opportunity befriender of presidents. That is very true. Uh, both Democrats and Republican. He was respected by both by both parties. Mm. Uh, you know until until later in life when he sort of you know when he stopped appearing in public and sure. Uh, but he's a but, lifelong registered Democrat. She pointed out. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> Which was so interesting to me. Uh, I don't, there's a million ways we could try to make sense of that, and we, you know, and we just we don't know what a lot of those private conversations were like between Graham and Richard mm-hmm. Nixon, for example, or Graham and Ronald Reagan. Uh, you know, we some of this we just we just don't know the degree to which he functioned as a as a conscience for pol- for political leaders. Um, now, I, I do think there, there is merit to the idea that 
uh, to, to advance a kingdom agenda at times, in, in the minds of some folks, required and, 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 and required more political influence than I think we should have been comfortable with. Hmm. Now, I think we're, we're, we started in a good place because there are, there are some things that I think are biblical moral positions that ought to be things that the law and public policy are concerned about. You know, for example, I think the, the right to life of the unborn. Sure. I think is a, is a fundamental civil rights issue. Uh, that the law ought to be concerned about. So, that, yep. so anytime we're, we're involved in public policy, we're also suggesting that this is a place where the law ought to be involved. Mm-hmm. But with public policy, and this is where this is where I think has been problematic, is we bring the same sort of expectations that we have theologically for for theological purity into the political realm, okay. which is in the political realm is invariably something fundamentally different. It's a, it, the political arena is a place of negotiation and compromise and limited objectives. You know, our theological realm, not you know, not nearly so much. And for some, I think for some, for some religious folks of all stripes, who get involved in the political arena, they get caught off guard by that. And for the, and co- compromise in the political arena is not a dirty word. It's an essential means of survival. Which means if you if you opt for all of the pie, instead of some of it, you're probably going to get none of it. Mm. And so the idea that you would be content with a limited objective is par for the course in the political arena, but anathema in the theological mm. one. And I think some some of that has been has contributed to overreaching on the part of religious believers in the political arena and also contributed okay. to a disillusionment gotcha. with the political. That, that's how I think we ought to that, a- approach it. That, that's interesting. I, if, if I was going to sum up my concern, I think the church, we obviously have to have a pastoral voice but have a prophetic voice. And the more the church cozies up to politicians on either side, you lose that prophetic voice. And I think she gives at least some sufficient example of ways where I look at this, and I don't know all the details, maybe it's tailored in a certain way where some nuance is lost, but I look at that and I think, hmm, whether left or right, here's a theological leader allowing themselves to be used for a political platform. Is that wise and are we losing a prophetic voice? That's at least a question think, we no, need I think to that, ask. No, and, there, and again, people of, of a number of religious stripes have raised the same question. I think you can say this. I think she critiques this on the right, but yes. I think you can make the same criticism on the left. I agree. Uh, and that the prophetic voice of the left, it, which they pride themselves in, is often compromised by the alignment with the with an, one political party's agenda. Now, I think we've got this. Is where we have to remind our audience that. Mm. No political platform is perfect. No political platform aligns point by point by point hmm. with biblical faithfulness. And there's a good reason for that. And that is because no political platform was written with that as the goal. Right. It, that's, that wasn't their Fair purpose. Enough. Now, there may have been some, some parts of some platforms may have been written in order to win the support of a fairly sizable religious community mm. of one stripe or another. Uh, and so the degree to which you know, those religious groups allow themselves to be co-opted, I think, is a, a valid point that I think she, yes. she is justifiably critical yep. of. I think you're right that it goes both ways. I read this as an evangelical, and one temptation is to go, yes, but the other side does it too, which is true within the Christian fold. But I also read and go, right. okay. Are these fair examples? Do but, we need to yeah, not do but, this? But it's when you say the other side does it too. <laughs> yes. Which which I think, you know, turns that back, you know, upon ourselves. I, to I, look more carefully at. I and think I think that's, that's I, fair. I think there's a there's a valid point yep. to that. You know, now it wasn't that long ago that some of the folks who had cozied up to political leaders on the right, you know, expressed disillusionment with that too. I know Chuck Colson toward the end of his life, uh, you know, his last project had nothing to do with politics. It was all about mm. ethics and morality. 
Um, and I know some, you know, some of the original spokespeople for the religious, religious right uh, in the moral majority became very disillusioned with politics. And I think they recognized that they had, they had been used and co-opted mm. in some unhealthy ways. That's a great lesson that, that did not make it in this book unless I missed it. I think that's very, very fair. The other, the other positive point before we raise some concerns is there's a huge section in the end of the book where there's a number of abuse cases. And she says, Christians, evangelicals used to think this was a Catholic issue, and then it came knocking at her own door, and there's a lot of cases of abuse. And her premise, as I understand it, is there's something embedded within this evangelical white culture that tends to be complementarian that lends itself to that kind of abuse. Is it theological? Is it in practice? What exactly is it? Without fully answering that question, she's unmistakably right that there have been a lot of cases of abuse within the evangelical culture. We can point fingers until we're blue in the face at Hollywood, Catholic Church, public schools, Boy Scouts, you name the institution. But I read that going, okay, yeah, we missed it. And we got to get this right and learn some of these hard lessons, even if my takeaway might be different than what she suggests in the book. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure the. the I mean, this is where I'm not sure her diagnosis is quite correct, because I think she makes a theological diagnosis mm -hmm. that I would put in a different place. She her diagnosis comes comes out. That's basically is that a lot of these abuses are a fallout of a, a complementarian view of, of gender roles. Yes, that's right. Which for, for audiences that may not be familiar with that term, what we're basically saying is that there are, there are, there's a difference in roles and functions in both the church and the home between men and women, and that there are certain leadership roles in the church that are mm -hmm. reserved for men, uh, mm -hmm. namely elders, uh, and there are, and there's, there's the responsibility for male leadership for in the home. Okay. Now again, what that, how that cashes out in the home can, sure. I mean, that can look. That's yeah. A wide variety of, of options for that. I think where she's missed it is, I would put it theologically in our doctrine of sin, which mm. is the genesis of this, because I think these are more about s simple, straightforward abuses of power. And essentially, nar narcissism run amok in our churches, and how it's, mm -hmm. I'm still it's still a little bit of a mystery to me how we can claim to worship a crucified Savior and tolerate these kind of narcissistic impulses that's, that's among our question. among our church leaders. That's that, that may have to be reserved for when we get to glory. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so clearly, the abuse is not people saying, "Let's go to Ephesians five and take seriously what Scripture teaches yeah. about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church." <laughs> yeah. That's not what's taking place no. here. Rather, your argument is, and I think it makes sense. There's narcissism. There's people who want power and are going to use Scripture justification if at all, and the abuse yeah. comes out of that core issue rather yeah. than the theology itself. Now, let me, I mean, just to be clear about this, that's not to say that there aren't places where a complementarian theology has been misapplied. Okay. okay? For, for example, uh, you know, we, we've of, often heard that uh, people will extend that and claim that, that those role distinctions take place in, in all areas of culture, not just the church and the home, mm -hmm. which is clearly an application that the Scripture doesn't intend to make. It's also been, mis I think, misunderstood with the sort of the notion that you know men are initiators and women are responders, which I think is a gross oversimplification and yeah. taught nowhere in the Scripture, in my view. Yeah. Which th then women apply that to say, well, you know, God must not be in favor of me having leadership positions. In, in whatever, in my company or in my, mm. you know, in, in whatever arena that I'm operating in. So I, mm. I want to be careful that we don't, you know, we don't, we don't give complementarianism a pass entirely on the way it's been misinterpreted. I'm not, I'm not at all persuaded that that's the way it's taught, but I think that those are some of the things that people take, those are takeaways that are not legitimate. Mm. 
I think that's that. that's fair. I, it'd be fascinating to see studies about church abuse, spouse abuse across different denominations, complementarian, egalitarian. And if your hypothesis is right, it wouldn't be that significant of a difference across them. I'd love to see those studies at at some point. Nonetheless, we these do have, kinds we, of abuse yeah, in the church, yeah. oh, evangelicals we, need to take seriously. And anyone who puts a spotlight on that uh, is raising important questions. Yeah. And, and and I think she rightly points out the cover-ups have been damaging too. Mm. You know, then that... You know, we, we have we have to believe, you know, women don't bring these accusations lightly, uh, you know, and so dismissing them as frivolous or unfounded, I think, is really a problem. Well, now, let's get to some of the yeah, we got, we have, we do have we do have a lot to say th- yeah. that that's critical of it, too. Mm-hmm. So uh, I know I know you have raised a criticism about the, the overtly political lenses through which she tends to view the historical record. Uh, so when, spell, spell that out a little bit. Yeah, if you open up the book right away in the intro and right away in the premise, it's clear that Donald Trump is the foil. No question about that. So you look at the way he's described, uh, the characters attributed to him are all negative. Whether they're true or not, that's the lens through which he is viewed. And then at the end of the premise, after describing that he is nationalistic and militaristic and sexist, etc., it says, hours after crossing the threshold of 270 electoral votes to secure his victory, President-elect Joe Biden called on Americans to restore the soul of America. He called for unity, for an end to the demonization that pits fellow Americans as enemies. Now, what's interesting to me is this is not said explicitly. It's cataloged or described as a historical look at evangelicals, but there's clearly a political aim here. You look at the way conservatives and Republicans are consistently cast, Obama and Clinton and Biden consistently cast positively. Now, my point here is not to say she's right or say she's wrong. I don't ever tell somebody how to vote. I have not taken a political position. If it was reverse, I would make the same critique. But I think anybody reading this shouldn't think, here's a historian who's trying to just make sense of why evangelicals seemingly voted and got Trump into power. There's an underlying political agenda behind this and a political ideology that informs the whole thing. Well, she had an opportunity to be more even-handed. I, I, with, think, with, I think so, too. And here's specifically what I mean. Uh, is I think there's 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 a, there's a sort of a pox on both your houses because there's hypocrisy on both sides of this because okay. people on the left gave Bill Clinton a pass on his character flaws that led to his you know multiple affairs and were publicly very critical of Donald Trump for his character flaws because they favored Clinton's policies which had a, especially starting out, had a very strong left-leaning tilt. In the same way, folks on the right gave Donald Trump much the same pass on his character flaws because they liked the agenda and were in favor of the Supreme Court justices that he might appoint. Okay? So I think there's, you know, if character matters, then it has to matter on both sides of the aisle. Uh, okay. Which nope. is... No, oh, sorry. Maybe a critique would be, but one side didn't call themselves the religious right and the moral majority. So the power play was from one side, right. not the other. I can imagine somebody pushing back and saying that. Well, but Bill Clinton was not shy about his religious faith either, uh, even though he, you know, it was it was more mainline denominational. It would, I think he would not have identified as evangelical. Okay. Um, but I think. You know, everybody, everybody recognized that he had huge character flaws that led to his multiple mm. infidelities. And, you know, his critics were, you know, that, that was all that mattered. But his supporters were, were quite willing to overlook all of those, hold their nose, mm. 
and vote for him because of the policies he was advocating. My mm. point is that that's precisely what happened on the right with the election of Donald Trump. I, I don't know of too many people on the right who were defending Donald Trump's character. Rather, the question was, you know, you know, mm. do, do, you know, how much do we do favor his policy so we can hold our nose and vote for someone whose character we have problems with? So I mean, mm. I mean it's, I think not, so. it's, it's quite it's exactly the same on both sides, That's in my fair. view. So just to give specifics, when you cite Obama here on page two thirty five, it says, in response to some of the uh, criticism he had been given, he gave one of the most powerful speeches of his career. He professed his unyielding faith in the decency and generosity of the American people. Obama's avowal of love for country was enough for many Americans, but not for most evangelicals. Clinton was a devout Christian. She reminded Americans that they were great because they were good. And she urged them to summon the better angels of their nature. The fact that she read the same Bible didn't register for most uh, evangelicals. So I just, if you're going to read this, clearly there's characterization on both sides. And we're all tempted to do that. I'm sure I've done that. I catch myself describing Dawkins, who's an atheist. I'm like, well, he's an atheist and, you know, William and Craig is the greatest philosopher. I'm like, okay, that's biased. Like, we're all tempted to do that. (laughs) But it's in print, and it just shows that there's a bias behind it. And it makes me wonder, who exactly is the audience for this book? Because there's two audiences. She describes at the beginning a lot of people who started to hear her criticize white evangelical culture say, this is my story. They resonate with it. So it makes me think it's more of a disenfranchised who has this beef against the evangelical culture or evangelical white culture to use this. Because I'm I'm reading I'm reading her book and I'm going, I grew up in the heart of the evangelical culture as much as anybody. I've been every camp, I've been every conference. My dad's mentioned in the book. I know a ton of these people. And I'm looking at this going, she raises a fair concern, but that was decidedly not my experience. So if she's trying to write this to actually persuade white evangelicals, you could take such a more charitable, nuanced approach to it that would just be more effective. Right. Now you you know, you mentioned that your your dad was mentioned in relationship to an event in the nineteen seventies mm. that she pays a lot of attention to. And you you're suggesting mis misrepresents the, the the thesis that she's trying to portray. Yeah, so one of my, I guess one of my differences with this is I think anytime you have a premise, you have to take evidence that supports your premise and ignore those that don't or explain away the evidence that doesn't. And there's a lot of things she talks about that I, she talks about Oliver North and I'm like, okay, I remember that story, but I don't know the particulars. So I tried to take a few issues that I know and probe in deeper and see what we find. So there's this, on page 47, it says, quote, evangelical support for Nixon was manifest at Campus Crusades Explo 72. Now, this is four years before I was born, but uh, the point was there was- I just graduated from high school. (laughs) Okay, I'm glad you said it, not me. It attracted 80,000 evangelical young people to Dallas's Cotton Bowl. And it's described how there's it's very supportive of the military and Nixon. And it says, quote, on the next page, the alliance between the Republican Party and evangelical Christians seemed secure. So last night at dinner, I was like, hey, Dad, you're on crusade then. Is this true? And he told me something I didn't know. He goes, actually, it was my idea to come up with Expo 72. <laughs> He's the one who had the idea Mm -hmm. and was the key promoter of this event. And some of his ideas were carried out. He goes, son, I was there. Any political party in power would have been invited, Republican or Democrat, because of the national prominence that was being drawn to the message. Now, it's a fair question to ask, should an event like this have any political presence at all? That's a fair question. But the point was, this is cast because Nixon was there as a distinctly pro-Nixon event. But he told me last night, he goes, if it was a Democratic president, would have been invited and people would have shown the respect and cheered for him at an event like this, just like they did for Nixon. So I won't go into all of them, but there's a number of things that I read in this. And I just thought that it's been... 
twisted, arguably, and I'm not going to say intentionally, but we all have an, a, an approach to this. And I just found it part of the story, but missing a lot incomplete. of the elements. It was very incomplete. You know, one, one other part of this that I think is, is incomplete are the, the, the handful of places. And it, it's, it's, it's there in the beginning, and it's also there at the end where she makes the claim, which I think is widely accepted as gospel truth, that 80% of evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Turns out that's not quite the case. That's right. And it's a a case of selective use of statistics. Um, So spell out a little bit what more the real thing is. So I found it interesting that in the intro and the premise, she cites this statistic three times, and then two other times throughout the book. So clearly this statistic is central in the story that she's telling. She says, quote, uh, on page, what is it, Roman numerals 14, (laughs) XIV, exit polls revealed that 81% of white evangelicals voted for Trump. Now she stated that clearly, it's about exit polls, but the implication as this is stated is that it's the majority of evangelicals a strong majority of evangelicals that support Trump and put him into office. Well, there's a few blogs online, even a Christianity Today article about this that challenges this 80% notion and says it's not quite complete. There's a lot more to this story. And one of the things is think about this. Uh, I wrote this down to make sure I got it right. Is 40% of those who characterize themselves as white evangelicals didn't vote at all. 40% didn't. So if you take the 40% who didn't vote, and according to this 80%, the 20% who voted but not for Trump, that actually means that 48% of self-identified white evangelicals voted for Trump. That means a majority of evangelicals did not vote for him. That doesn't tell the same story and have the same ring that you fractured a nation and you, yeah. you know, corrupted a faith. Now, it's still a fair question. Why did so many people vote for Trump? That's a fair question. I love that she raised it, but what everybody's hearing is 80% of you, and you just pull it up, it's like Washington Post, all these news organizations use this kind of stat typically to castigate and criticize the white evangelical church. So the stat itself is not complete. The other part is like, what is an evangelical? What does it even mean? Now she does raise this in her book. She's like, evangelicals understand themselves theologically, but even evangelicals recognize that oftentimes they don't, they have theological and biblical illiteracy. So there's a cultural understanding. So to her credit, she recognizes that the term evangelical is somewhat, it's ambiguous and not clear. Look, I've had a chance to be interviewed by New York Times and by CNN, by their religion correspondents, and at least in these two circumstances, it's very clear that they do not understand what an evangelical is. Even within the church, most people don't understand. So that's another piece of it that says, who are we talking about here? And then even... Uh, on you know on top of that there's other things like why did they vote for Trump now she gets into that in the book but it's for a range of reasons some economic some uh, pro-life Supreme Court but what I find is there's a lot of people who look at evangelicals who voted for Trump and they assume they voted for for a certain reason and import a worldview upon them rather than actually ask them. And the story is often very different. So at least five times in her book, three times in the premise is this stat shaping it. And if that's so central to the book and that stat is not as strong as it sounds, to me it questions the larger narrative. Okay, I think that calls some of the premise into question. Yeah, at least so. Uh, at least the extent of yeah. the premise. It's part of the story but it's cast as the whole story, yeah. and I don't think it's a whole story. So we would, I mean, we would hold, there There are things that we need to pay attention to from this. Absolutely. Uh, but there are things that we take issue with as well. Let's, let's just sort of summarize sort of one last reflection on this. Mm. Uh, what, what would you say to our audience uh, 
if they end up watching this, go out and go out and pick up the book? I would say read it with an open mind. Don't be unnecessarily defensive. Look for positive ways that the evangelical community needs to improve and get better with its use of power, its relationship to politics, uh, what it communicates about gender. But be skeptical that what's painted as the whole story, there is another side to this that's left out. I mean, there's a proverb, I think it's 1820, that says the first to speak in court sounds right until the Mm cross-examination begins. And that should be the way you read any book, like the Bereans in Acts 17, they examine scripture daily. So I thoroughly enjoyed reading this because I grew up in the evangelical church. I'm like, I remember Promise Keepers. I was a student at Biola and I went during that time. Like I thoroughly enjoyed it. If you want a longer book that has a historical approach and critiques evangelical culture that's well-written, it's a book worth reading, but I think a lot is left out. Yeah, we we just we just want to, we want to make sure that people don't draw conclusions based on an incomplete narrative. Mm-hmm. So, thank you for joining us for this. We hope this has been a helpful conversation for you. Uh, we would we we would commend the book to you, uh, even though we take issue with it in a number of places. We think it's got some valuable contributions to make, and we think we think you ought to you ought to read it. Uh, but just read it recognizing the lenses through which the author is, is viewing the subject.